it, it became very uh, uh, obvious to me over the last couple of years that uh, <coughs> HAS has a number of uh, members who are really involved in doing science. And I thought, uh, it, wouldn't it be great if we uh, gave everybody that was uh, uh, doing that a chance to be recognized and to let the rest of the organization know what they're doing? So out of that uh, came this um, uh, this uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, we're going to hear from a number of, uh, of our uh, members tonight, and I'm going to uh, introduce them all here. Um, the members that uh, we have are... Uh, um, first is Will Young. You uh, may know Will as a deep sky dude. Uh, he is typically found almost uh, every, if, if you've been around astronomy in Houston, uh, you, you will probably have met Will at uh, various outreach events. He's uh, at a lot of star parties and even a few uh, rocket launches. So uh, he's, always the, he's always the guy with the video camera and uh, you can catch him uh, on his YouTube channel at Deep Sky Dude. Um, Walt Cooney will be the moderator of the uh, event tonight. Um, and I need to uh, pull his, uh, pull the, uh, uh, there we go, come on. I'm Once again, I have, Technical difficulties here. I'm, I guess it's because I'm beyond where I need to be, right? Um, any rate, uh, um, Walt's a retired chemical engineer, and uh, he's been doing uh, astronomy since he was a very young uh, person. And uh, it, it turns out that um, over the course of, uh, of uh, years, he's been doing uh, uh, various things like uh, variable stars, cataclysmic variables, exoplanets. He's actually even uh, had been published on, uh, I think it's like 50 papers uh, 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 that uh, include his uh, work. So uh, Walt is about the most experienced uh, person we have doing uh, uh, astro uh, astronomy science in uh, HAS. Um, Michael Rapp uh, is, um, uh, I'm, I'm ad lib here because <laughs> I can't get my the word file up that I have all these introductions in. So bear with me for half a second. Um, uh, and uh, let's see if I can do this again. Uh, why, why am I not getting this up? Um, Go ahead, uh, Michael, if you don't mind coming off mute and, and introducing yourself, I apologize. I'm just, I'm, I'm having a little technical difficulty. Oh, no problem at all. I am no stranger to technical difficulties. I'm Michael Rapp. I've been an active amateur astronomer since my freshman year in high school. Um, I've been a member of HAS for, I think, 12 years now. Um, I enjoy galaxies with my dob, double stars with my refractor, and of course, what you're gonna hear about for me, variable stars with my binocular, binoculars. By day, I'm a digital forensic analyst for the University of Houston system, and my other hobby includes cleaning the cat fur off of my telescope optics from my 12 cats. Okay, and um, uh, Chris Ober uh, is, uh, is next on the list. Uh, Chris is um, uh, our uh, just, uh, director for the observatory, the Dark Sky Site, and uh, Chris is um, uh, uh, very talented uh, guy. He's been uh, doing a lot for us in terms of uh, getting the observatory out there set up. And he's going to talk a little bit about a uh, uh, new research telescope that we've got up. He's also a friend of Walt's and Walt's a very persuasive guy. Walt has uh, managed to get uh, uh, Chris doing cataclysmic variables and he's going to talk about that uh, tonight. Uh, Brian Kudnick um, is a uh, 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 is, is, uh, the lab uh, uh, manager for Prairie View a and uh, University. And uh, one of the nice things that uh, perks that comes with his job, he was very instrumental in getting set, uh, a research telescope uh, set up at the university. And uh, I, underst I understand he gets to use it too. Um, Brian also is a very experienced uh, uh, individual in terms of doing um, uh, uh, 
astronomical science as part of his uh, his uh, am amateur astronomy. And uh, in fact, he's been doing uh, variable star uh, uh, and sunspot, sunspot counts for, uh, he'll tell you, but it's for a long number of years. And last but not least, I'm the, I am the least of the, the, uh, of the uh, folks here on this uh, list. Uh, I'm uh, also a friend of Walt's and Walt convinced me to get involved in um, this uh, cameras for all sky meteor surveillance. Uh, and I, I, it was a kind of a good step for me because from the time I decided I wanted to get into amateur astronomy, I was always interested in the in the possibility of doing science, and here I am. So, uh, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Walt. Um, are you, uh, I got to make sure my screen is shared, uh, and I think we uh, can do that now. There we go. Can you see my screen? And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Walt. Um, you got it. Are you able to see me, uh, Walt? Oh, I'm sorry. I got a couple other slides. Um, yeah, this is still yours. All yours. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Uh, that um, I just uh, plug for what uh, uh, citizen, citizen scientists are doing in terms of astronomy. Um, it, it every day uh, throughout uh, uh, throughout uh, the the world, really, uh, amateurs are doing actual science. And in doing that, uh, pretty much assisting professional astronomers uh, because we have capabilities and observing techniques that the pros can't duplicate. They got great big telescopes, they got great uh, uh, instrumentation, but what they can't do is uh, uh, that they can't stay on bright things for very long because the telescopes are so big, uh, amateur uh, uh, Telescopes have a much wider field of view than the pros do. And one of the things that uh, amateurs can do because we control the telescopes, we can stay on an object as long as it takes to get the data. And that's not always possible for the pros. Um, the other thing I just wanted to uh, uh, point out, uh, typically it's uh, we, we, we're good at looking for transient phenomena. And you'll hear about some of that uh, uh, later on uh, this evening. But it's also possible, you don't have to have a, 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 a t telescope equipment to be an, uh, do, a, do astronomy science as a citizen scientist. Uh, if you haven't heard about it already, you need to check out a, a, a place online called the Zooniverse. It's kind of the collective place where all uh, citizen science online projects are, are uh, housed and presented. And a couple of, I picked a couple of the more uh, recent ones uh, out that are astronomy related. For example, the Dark uh, Energy Explorers, uh, the HEPDEX project, which is uh, down in Fort Davis, the Hobby Eberly uh, Telescope is doing uh, dark energy uh, 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 observations. And uh, as part of this uh, 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 online project, you're actually training an AI system to recognize very distant galaxies as part of the part of the uh, data reduction. Uh, there are several others, uh, but uh, 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 I would encourage you if you are interested in doing science, uh, that's a good place to get started. So with that, I'll turn it over to Walt. Okay, Will, and I will turn it over to Will. Will? Hey, thank you, Walt. Uh, I will request the thing. There we go. Okay, I don't have a lot of time, so I, thank you. I gotta, I gotta give you all a crash course on this as fast as I can. And I know uh, I'm gonna probably go over here. So let's see if I can get it to go to the next slide. Um. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So sprites are a newish science. Uh, we've known about sprites since antiquity. But the first sprite was captured in like 1989. So in, in the grand scheme of science things, this is brand new. Um, what you're seeing here is an image by my friend Stephen Hummel. A lot of us know Stephen. He works out at the McD, uh, McDonald Observatory, Fort Davis. And um, that vantage point gives him excellent vantage points to some of these amazing events. Um, I, I'm not going to go into the really hardcore science of, of how these things work. 
Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on some of that. And uh, but if you want to learn more about this, you contact me. We can talk about it. I love nerding out about this stuff. Or there's videos online too. Um, long story short, if I go to the next slide here, um, if you see at the bottom there, you have a, a CG lightning, which is cloud to ground. Uh, whenever you have a negative or a positive cloud to ground lightning strike, and yeah, lightning strike can be negative or positive. You can tell the difference just looking at it. I won't go into that here because that's a whole different side train. Whenever that cloud to ground lightning strike happens, right above that storm, uh, nitrogen is excited because there's an electrical uh, em emission that happens above the storm. And it's if you can think about this, uh, it's kind of below aurora but above the storm i like to call them storm aurora for that reason uh and if you notice that little thing up there that says ghost uh this is actually a newly discovered thing in the last couple years by a couple of youtubers uh pecos hank and paul smith um who are really good sprite hunters um i'm not going to go into each one of those things y'all can see what's on the screen there because i don't have a whole lot of time and i, and I don't want to eat into anybody else's because there's a lot of cool stuff coming uh but those are the kind of phenomena you can expect to see right there and you can see these with your naked eye i've seen about six or seven naked eye sprites um but um if i missed anything y'all can ask questions i just want to show a couple of images that stephen hummel got if you can see down here, this is actually the Hobby Eberly telescope. So it's fitting that uh, that was at the beginning slide there. That's the Hobby Eberly telescope. So this storm right here was probably a couple of hundred, maybe 300 miles from Stephen Hummel when he took the shot. What you want to catch these is a clear night above you, pre preferably no moon. So right, start to sound like a star party. Uh, and then you need a storm really far away like 200 miles, three or four. I think the, the furthest I've done is like 450 miles. The storm was in Mexico, and we were watching it from uh, McDonald Observatory. It was amazing. Um, you can see down here these little streamers. Uh, these streamers can be a quarter mile wide, and these big columns here can be a mile wide. Uh, and it's like a mile wide neon light in the sky for a 30th of a second, and then it's gone. Uh, and then like snowflakes, everyone's different. Um, another couple ones, you can see that they make these beads here. And this is, again, this is all just nitrogen being excited. It's at lower pressure. Um, and, um, this is the shot I took from the El Dorado star party. And so if you're wondering what the science part of it is, this is it spritacular.org. It's kind of a strange name. It's kind of weird. Um, but you can go on here and you can see all the different, um, people <coughs> submitting their stuff and, um, take pictures of it i won't go into like how to do that it's uh it if you have a dslr you can do it because they can be seen naked eye um but if you want to see videos on it uh like uh don said earlier deep sky dude i'm on youtube TikTok, instagram all that nonsense uh so you can find me there and you can find sprite videos and see how they evolve and go catch sprites because they're awesome that's all i've got thank y'all uh way cool will I, I have never seen one of those but we'll be looking now actually um we we do have a minute for questions if anybody wants to submit something on the um on chat and then we'll uh open the mic to you uh we'll also take some time after all the presenters uh, sure. for a few questions too i can relinquish control or how do i do that do i just stop remote control there you go Got okay, it. so Bill Spit, Spit Series is asking uh, if there's any info on how hot they are. So what I've heard is it's really cold. So lightning is hot. You know, it's like the surface of the sun. Sprites are more of a colder plasma kind of thing. So um, I bet it you, if you were up there, well, you'd be dead because of the air pressure, right? But uh, it probably wouldn't be pleasant to be inside of a Sprite if you can, if you know, if you see what I'm saying. But uh, yeah, it's colder than lightning so that's why it's not lightning it's a it's almost like an aurora but not really and, and a quick question for me so just to be sure i understand it so you know these pictures that have multiple those those just are individual flashes that were caught at a time exposure over time huh yeah so like the fourth one from the right you see all the what we call columns um you know those are like i said a mile wide and those are typically from negative cloud to ground strikes not always but sometimes and you'll, they're called dancing sprites, where if you watch my videos, they kind of 
come at you. They, they dance at you. Um, it's almost like a wave. So as the lightning propagates through the cloud and then connects with the ground above it, it's doing that dance with this, uh, I, I guess, ionized or excited nitrogen. Uh, again, I'm not an expert. I'm just a citizen scientist uh, turning in what I catch out there. So uh, it's, 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 it's cool. And what's cool about this is brand new. People like us can make like amazing discoveries because a YouTuber who does storm chasing discovered ghosts. That's what they're calling it. So cool. Okay. Well, hey, let's move on for the moment then. Uh, next up is Michael Rapp to tell us about uh, variable star observing. Michael? Just requested control and I have control. All right. Okay. All right, really quickly before I get into this, what are variable stars? Variable stars, quite simply, they are stars that vary in brightness. They go from bright to dim, back to bright, back to dim again. They might have a regular pattern. They might have an irregular pattern. And what Chris is going to talk about, they might be uh, cataclysmic. Um, but they tell us a lot of things. They're important scientifically because they tell us everything from stellar evolution on to refining oh, intergalactic distances. Um, but for most of my astronomy career, I did not find stars interesting. I mean, the more magnification you put on your telescope, the stars essentially look the same. Why would I ever want to look at stars? Well, about 10 years ago, I turned 40 years old and I realized that most of my life might be behind me instead of, instead of in front of me, strangely enough. And I realized I wasn't doing enough astronomy. Astronomy is very important to me. It's part of who I am. It's part of my identity. So I needed to find a way to do more visual astronomy. And I, I wish I could get out to the dark sky site more than I do, but you know my university responsibilities often keep me here on New England weekends. So I needed to find a way to do astronomy from my driveway, so it's convenient, so I don't have to go anywhere, in the city where my zenith limiting magnitude is four on a good night, on a great night actually, on a weeknight when I'm tired, during the summer when it gets dark so late, and with the moon up, with, within reason of course. And, and also, I was also troubled by another thing. You know, I started getting to staying. Y'all may have experienced this. You're like, ah, this globular cluster looks like this globular cluster looks like this globular cluster. Oh, look, another 12th magnitude galaxy. I just, I realized I wanted to do something more than just look. I wanted to interact with the objects that I was observing. Uh, so, and I realized several people in the club were into this AAVSO thing. So I decided to check it out. And I'm glad that I did because it's an amazing amount of, Fun. Let me show you some of my equipment. This is basically what I do. 90% of my work is binoculars, 10% with my telescope. You can see my daub in the background there. Uh, this is my main rig. It's a pipe mount um, with some 15 by 70s on it. Um, these I recently upgraded to. For, the, for most of my year, I've been using these you know, 10 by 50s handheld stuff. You do not need expensive equipment to do this science stuff. You don't need heavy equipment to do this science stuff. Um, and so I use those. You can see I've got I've got trees everywhere, and so I have to look out a little bit of window of the sky there. Um, again, simple equipment: star chart, a, a variable star atlas, a uh, star chart to find the star, and then simply my log, where I log the variable star name, date, time, what I believe the magnitude of the star is, the comparison stars, and then I upload that to the AVA VSO database. Um, this is how I organize my charts. Again, I want something convenient I can do from my driveway. So they're alphabetical. They're not by right ascension. So I literally open my garage door, walk outside of it, make sure it's clear. You know, if Leo is up there, I grab the Leo charts. If Ariga is up there, I grab the Ariga charts. I don't have to think, you know, if I've only got five or 10 minutes, I can do some meaningful, fun astronomy that uh, has a scientific merit. And... This is a light curve of the star Aris Ophiuchi in Ophiuchus. Uh, very quickly at the bottom, it's time. This is three years worth of data. Magnitude is on the left, um, bright to dim. As you can see, the star kind of hangs out between 10th and 11th magnitude. This gap here is because it was behind the sun. You can't see it. And then sometime in the middle of July, it shot up to fourth magnitude. What is that about? Well, as some, most of you probably surmised, this is a nova, not a supernova, but a nova. Um, you can kind of barely see it here, but these little clover leaf things there, those are my observations. Those are my scientific measurements of this star, this nova. 
that's me contributing to the scientific history, the measurement history of this particular SAR. That's incredibly philosophically um, meaningful to me to have contributed in some small part, but still a part, to the advancement of the scientific knowledge of the cosmos for humanity. That's really cool. And I get a, a huge thrill about that. Um, but to finish up here real quickly, let me show you this. So this you'll recognize as um, a piece of Sky and Telescope's pocket, pocket Sky Atlas. You'll recognize Orion down there. And then the arrow here is pointing to a star uh, innocuously called BL Orionis. BL Orionis is not a particularly noteworthy star. It's not particularly bright. It's not particularly dim. But I went finding the star. I star hopped to it. I couldn't see it one night. A few weeks later, I tried again. I still couldn't see it. A few weeks later, still couldn't see it. And then two weeks later, took my binoculars, went up there and looked at it. And by this time, I was very familiar with the field. And there was a star there that wasn't there before. That's crazy. And um, it just absolutely, it was just an immense thrill. And I was able to make a measurement. And then I measure, kept observing it over a period of several weeks. And the star got brighter and brighter and brighter to where it was, it was unmistakable that there was a star there. It was crazy. And so I was able to watch it increase in brightness as Orion went across the sky and then lower in brightness over, over the course of several months. And that was just such an immense thrill um, to interact with these objects and record them scientifically. It's a lot of fun. If any of this resonates with any of you, you've got to check it out. This stuff is an incredible amount of fun. So back to you, Walt. Okay, thanks. And so any questions on the chat? But I got a quick question for you, Michael. So so where do you get all your charts? Where do you get all the information? Sure, um, I, you, can, you can print them off of the ABA, ABSO website. Uh, they have several programs. Uh, the one I'm in is the Binocular Star Program. It's a list of about 100 stars. And you go in there and you print out all the charts. They've got ones for telescope. They've got legacy variables, all these types of things. You can kind of figure out what you're interested in and observe those types of stars. Cool. Mike, are you involved with the AAVSO? Yeah, been a member for um, been a member for about three years. That's another good point. You do not have to be a member of the AAVSO to submit observations. In fact, I was submitting observations for six, seven years before I joined. <coughs> And, and hey, you have a question from Martiel. Um, Michael, how do you determine the brightness? Sure. So on a chart, there will be comparison stars. These are statically um, static stars. They do not vary in brightness. And they have known magnitudes. And so what you do is you look at your target star, and you look at a comparison star. Is it brighter or dimmer than that star? Um, and then you go look at another star. You kind of basically narrow down your your brightness is here till you find out um, what you think it is. And over several years, I I found myself I can get it down to maybe two tenths of a magnitude if I'm if I if I've got really good sky conditions. It's challenging and a lot of fun. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Chris Ober. Didn't hear any of that one. Okay, let me request. Oh, uh, sorry, I was I was on mute. I I introduced Chris Ober too. Nobody heard. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks, Don. So no Chris Ober, cataclysmic variable star hunter. You you have control. Okay, yay. Okay, cataclysmic variable. Star, basically photometry, doing what uh, Michael is doing, but with uh, telescopes and CCD camera. There it goes. Uh, basically, what is a cataclysmic variable star? It's a binary star consisting of a white dwarf and a normal type star in the uh, main sequence. Uh, the white dwarf is siphoning off matter from the normal star because they are in extremely close orbits. Some of these things are orbiting, uh, or, uh, completing orbits around each other and less than an hour on some of these things. And incredibly fast, um, incredibly cool objects. Uh, Walt did a much uh, more thorough 
talk in his uh, Stars They Go Boom, which is on the uh, HAS YouTube channel. Uh, pretty good talk, so I encourage you to go check that out. Why? Um, this is what ChatGPT says, why people want to study cataclysmic aerial stars. Uh, basically, you're understanding stellar evolution, um, help us gain better understanding of how these stars are moving, uh, understand, helping trying to understand why they're, why they're doing this at um, such odd intervals some, sometimes. Uh, and cataclysmic variables are great laboratories to study a lot of these uh, astrophysical, astrophysical processes. Um, they're very active, they're constantly changing, and some of them are quite er quite erratic, so it just adds a little more, um, little more excitement to studying them. Getting started, you don't have to be an astrophysicist to do this stuff. You just need a telescope and a CCD camera. Um, you don't need a lot of expensive equipment to do it. Uh, I'm using 20, 25 year old CCD camera, not the latest and greatest CMOS stuff, and it's not, it's not even a full frame. It's just basic, as long as it's um, consistent and you know, uh, you know how, that tell, how that camera operates, uh, a mono camera. And as long as you can track on a star for a, a few minutes, you're good to go. You can, you can, you can actually contribute to stuff. You don't need a big telescope. Um, I'm using a, just a 10-inch 10 10-inch uh, Newtonium, uh, nothing fancy. Um, you don't need a Takahashi. Doesn't have, doesn't have to be a Takahashi or a RCOS or a plane wave or anything like that. You can just do it with a refractor, uh, an SCT, or a, a Newtonian. You can start without filters. Uh, a lot of these uh, the cataclysmic variables we're measuring, you're just taking a single picture or um, you're focusing on a single star for hours at a time with just a clear filter or a luminosity filter. And you can get valuable data with that. Um, Mooney and single nights are okay. You don't have to co compile lots of data over multiple nights. Uh, the more data you get, it's also, uh, that's also good, but if you only have one night to do, that's that's fine too. You can, you can uh, compile and submit quality data. And, then, and the pictures don't have to be uh, APOD quality. If you look at my stars here, they all have they all have problems and that's okay. Uh, this, the software can still, uh, can still measure these and can contribute good data. Uh, as long as the data is good, it's consistent and you have a consistent approach every single time, you can do the same, you can uh, record these stars and submit them and contribute as well. Uh, on the screen here, Mike was talking about the check star and references star. Here's an example of what the, uh, that the software does. The, the V, the red green one here, that's the, the variable star. That's the cataclysmic variable. Uh, the red one here is the reference star. That, that's, um, like Michael, like Michael had said, that that one we know the magnitude of is not going to change, and we also have a secondary check star here that also the magnitude is not going to change, and we and the software will figures it out this this uh, amount of signal that each of these stars have, and can tell you and compares to what the variable one is, and can tell you its brightness. Where do we find the targets? Sites like the AAVSO, uh, CBA, which is the Center for Backyard Astrophysics, and CVNet. Uh, a lot of times they'll post stars that they want people to submit data for, and we'll work on those and submit data that. And it varies from month, it can vary from month to month or a couple of times a year. And here's a few examples of the light curves from a few cataclysmic variable stars that were submitted to uh, from uh, Center for Backyard uh, Observatory members. Uh, the software to, to use for post-processing these, uh, it's free. And these are a few of the programs to, for post-processing. Uh, the first one here, the less the photometry, that will actually analyze the images 
for you, generate the, the charts needed to submit them to either CBA, CVNet, or the AAVSO. So again, you don't need expensive software to do this. There are free stuff that lets you gather good data. And for more information, here's a few websites to, of course, the one everyone likes to, everyone seems to uh, know right off the bat is the AAVSO. Um, they have a cataclysmic variable section that is headed, headed up by Walt and Sean, I believe. Sean. Uh, the British Astronomical Association has a variable star section there. Here's the Center for Backyard Astrophysics. Um, it's a small group of mostly amateurs around the world that are contributing uh, measurements to the CBA, which uh, Professor at Columbia, uh, Columbia University is, has headed up and is doing active research on those on the, based on the data that we're sending. And then there's the Cataclysmic Variables Network, and you can find alerts on uh, alerts on stars that need uh, that need measurements or just more general information on them. And the last slide we have here is the new research telescope we have in the main observatory at the dark site. Uh, this is a 16 inch Ritchie Cratian. Uh, it's RCOS optics, it's on a Paramount ME. Uh, this equipment was donated to us from, from a uh, long time HAS member. And currently we have a, just a QHY CMOS camera on there and it's loaded with uh, photometric filters, UBVRI. Uh, this thing is up and running and we, we were able to collect good quality data and submit it to the, the various groups as needed. And that's that's all I got. So I will release control. Okay, okay, thanks, Chris. And um, there was a question from Bill Spitziri uh, in the chat, uh, and I think Michael Rapp has already okay. uh, answered. I, I, I guess I'll throw out one other piece to that answer too: is you could, uh, you know, cataclysmic variable is kind of a broad catch-all category, and really any almost anything that goes boom in the night could be called a cataclysmic variable so yeah type 1a supernovae and and all these uh, are often all grouped together although there are many 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 different flavors so okay uh next up thanks chris next up we have uh brian kudnick on his solar sunspot count work and also variable star work as an aabso member brian okay Greetings, everyone. So let me go ahead and request control here. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the uh, sunspot counts and variable star observing. And all you need for this is the eyes and a small telescope will work. Um, in either case, although with the sun, you would want to have a um, safe solar filter. Um, I do direct observations of the sun um, with a uh, solar filter. Um, let's see if I can get this to advance. Okay, here we go. So I've been observing the sun visually and safely with the same solar filter. I use a four and a half inch reflecting telescope, uh, Newtonian type, and I've used that telescope to view Halley's Comet, um, a total eclipse of the sun in Mexico in 1991 and many other things. And that's the uh, scope I use primarily for sunspot counts to this day. Um, so since August of 1998, I've made systematic counts and reported these to the solar division of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. They also have a sudden ionospheric disturbance um, 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 section of that, that um, that's a group of radio astronomers that listen for disturbances from the Earth's ionosphere during solar flares. Um, I've um, done these counts almost every clear day um, whenever I'm available to do so, um, both at home or at work. I have a very similar telescope, actually an identical telescope at work with the filters. So if it's cloudy in the morning from home and then it clears up later in the day, I can go over to the observatory there, pull out the uh, telescope and do the uh, sunspot counts. Um, so far um, from June 2000 to February 2023, I've contributed 
225 monthly reports with a total of 4,835 observations. But um, the weird thing is that in the fall of 2018, I was recognized for making 5,000 observations. So um, I probably would estimate um, close to 5,500 observations. Um, and so what I do is I have a um, regular logbook that I, I have actually two of these logbooks. I have this one's my variable star logbook. And then this is one is where I keep my sunspot counts. And so what I do is I log them um, in those books whenever I take counts. And then I use a uh, program called Sun Entry at the end of each month. This is my text file from um, last month. I had submitted this and I wanted to get a screenshot of the Sun Entry program itself but it was after I had submitted this, I went ahead and put in one observation. And so what we have here is the number of groups, the number of spots and the wolf number. And the wolf number is the um, 10 times the number of groups plus the number of spots. And that gives you a wolf number. And so you can see the uh, different counts. Um, this is the universal time seeing um, number of groups, number of spots, the wolf number. Northern group, Southern group, Northern spots, Southern spots, and then the central group and the central spots. Um, you don't have to get that detail detailed in your sunspot counting, um, but what you can do is you can uh, just count the spots over the entire disk and report that, the number of groups and the number of spots, period. Um, this is actually a gong image from yesterday um, that was taken, and I wanna kind of give you an example of how I do this. So I look on the uh, solar disk through the telescope and I see that, okay, here's one spot, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Now oh, here's another one right here, 14, 15. So there's 15 Northern spots and then four, five, six groups. But then I see there's another one down here. So here's a Southern hemisphere spot. So there's one spot um, and one group. Um, what the central spot and the central group count is, so there's the northern hemisphere, and then there's the southern hemisphere, um, solar hemisphere, and then the central group, imagine drawing a um, circle, one half of a solar radius centered on the center of the sun, and I kind of take that imaginary circle and mentally superpose it on the sun and count anything that's within that circle, and that's what the uh, center group and center spot says. I just learned about that just recently, um, just a few years ago. Um, so I report um, the northern, southern um, groups and spot numbers, and also the central groups and central spot numbers. Okay, let's see if this is, there you go. Uh, sometimes it advances and sometimes it doesn't. So um, that's basically the sunspot observation. So what I do, that's my daytime um, astronomy job. And then the nighttime um, is the variable star observations. And I do observe from the backyard most of the time. As a matter of fact, I'll be getting up at four in the morning tomorrow morning to uh, um, do about 40 or 50 stars. Um, I've been observing stars in one form or another since 19. 81, just in general, um, I followed Myra in one of its cycles back in 86. Um, I started contributing to the AAVSO um, with my first observation. They had reminded me of this in an email that it was my 30th anniversary of contributing to the AAVSO. October 2nd, 1992, I made my first observation, which was R. Scuti. And since then, and as of today, 54,250 observations has been contributed to the AAVSO database uh, by me. And this is a real easy and enjoyable activity. It's really simple. Just pull out the telescope, set up the telescope. It is a go-to telescope, which enables me to get so many observations. Uh, of course, star hopping, it takes a little bit longer um, to get there. Um, and each star has its own personality. If you do, the, if you do this for a number of years, you kind of get to know these stars. Again, this is a typical chart. Um, the uh, chart comes with a uh, in different sizes. Um, this is a binocular, this is more of a binocular chart. Um, these numbers are the magnitudes of these comparison stars with the decimal point omitted. This is the target star, R. Scuti. So I basically look at how bright R. Scuti is and compare it to the, there's actually a few more stars that I usually use when it's at its brightest. Um, this one was interesting a few years ago, it dimmed so dim um, that you could barely see it with binoculars. And you could see these three stars and not the usual, um, quadrilateral that this uh, these stars make. Um, so I have about 110 stars on my list, and that includes mostly Myra type stars, but I do have a subset of, a, of, of other types like RV Tauri stars, um, maybe a cataclysmic variable or two, a dwarf nova or two. Um, I also, if an alert notice is given out, um, 
via the AAVSO for a supernova or a nova um, or some other interesting object that if they have um, um, the sentence visual observations are welcome, then I will add that star to my list of stars. Um, my record of observing stars in a single night is 115. When I had a much larger list, it was about 50% more than what I do, what I have today. That became just a little bit too much. So I kind of scaled back to the stars that were most in need of observations. And as a matter of fact, most of my stars um, are stars that are in need of observations that relatively few people in the world observe. As a matter of fact, there's about a dozen or so stars that I only am, that I'm the only observer. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop. It sounds like it's, um, that time went really quick, but um, I'll be ready to take any questions. Okay. Well, I've got a, a, a quick question for you, Brian. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if you had to estimate, I know you've spent a, a bunch of time at the uh, observatory uh, in Columbus. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, if you had to estimate, what, what percentage of your variable star observing have you done at the observatory? Um, I would probably say about maybe 15 to 20%, because I get out there once a month. I usually observe on average about once a week. Sometimes it's every five days, depending on the weather. Um, and in the dark site, um, it's usually only Friday or Saturday that I can get out there. And if that Friday or Saturday, that, that, that Friday or Saturday of the month is cloudy, then I might not get out there at all that month. As a matter of fact, there was a span of time where I was out there in December um, and then January was cloudy and I didn't make it out until February, but I was able to go out there for two Fridays in a row. And I do plan to uh, go out uh, two weeks from today. Um, so I need to put in my request for that. Um, but I try to get out there once a month, maybe twice a month. And I usually focus on the stuff that is too dim to get from my backyard easily. Um, but I do, um, I am able to get most of my stuff from the backyard, even under a full moon, I observe. So I just can't get the fainter ones. Okay. So Fantastic. Yeah, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brian. Right. Uh, Don, okay. Meteors. Yep. Sounds so, good. Let's see, give up. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, what what's really actually a fairly easy uh, way to get involved. I mean, once you get everything set up, uh, this cam cams or cameras for all sky meteor surveillance uh, program is actually uh, 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 fairly fairly uh, easy to participate in, and it's really kind of cool. Um, cams is an automated video surveillance uh, lit, uh, of the night sky. Uh, it's uh, uh, headed up by a, an astronomer by the name of Peter Jenkinson. Uh, we had uh, Peter as a, a speaker, a, a main, a, a, our main um, speaker, uh, I, I believe a little over a year ago. And, uh, and he talked about uh, meteor uh, showers in general and a little bit about CAMS. Um, but the idea behind it is uh, there are over 700 um, Historical meteor showers that uh, the that the International Astrono Astronomical Union recognizes, but most of them are you know from quite a long time ago when it was uh, the sky was dark and 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 you know average people reported it uh, visual sightings. So many of these uh, uh, historical meteor showers have uh, limited or no hard data to support their existence. So the idea is uh, by using uh, low light uh, 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 level security cameras to continuously monitor patches of the sky. Uh, the idea is to catch them um, uh, as many meteors as possible and, you know, track them back and see if they actually do correspond to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, historical meteor showers. Uh, the camp stations, I, there's a couple of them uh, uh, shown up here. This is actually mine and um, as Walt says, I think my uh, it's in the front yard. My wife is a, a, a saint. She let me put it in the front yard because it was the only place I could put it to uh, uh, give me uh, full sky coverage. Uh, and um, uh, at any rate, as Walt says, uh, he thinks my neighbors uh, uh, I, I think I'm AB normal, like abnormal. Okay. <laughs> But because they, 
they can all see it. And I regularly get questions for them whether I've seen the you know the Apophis uh, meteor that's going to wipe out the the dinosaurs again type of a, uh, of a thing. But at any rate, um, the uh, I I had a lot of fun actually putting the uh, the the system together and uh, and making it work. And down below here you see uh, Walt's uh, station, which is out at the uh, uh, observatory out in Columbus, which is much more professional looking than mine, than mine but uh, um, Walt's just anormal, okay? So anyway, I just thought I would leave it with that. Uh, <laughs> the idea is, is that you get a, a, a large number of uh, overlapping uh, cameras. And uh, this, this is a, uh, an earlier uh, version of uh, what we're doing here down in Southeastern uh, Texas. And you'll note that Walt's actually the uh, uh, the coordinator of CAMS Texas. Um, and at uh, any rate, um, uh, the, the idea is that with the overlapping uh, camera, uh, you, if, when you get the meteor in more than one camera, it's actually possible to uh, trace back and understand wh what uh, the path of the meteor took and, and uh, uh, as well as if you get enough uh, uh, data on it, you can actually calculate the uh, uh, the orbit it came from. And up up here last uh, uh, in 2021, there was a big uh, outburst in the Perseids uh, meteor shower, which um, our our cameras really did a good job of uh, picking up. And this is all of the tracks of the meteors uh, that uh, we caught on the, uh, out of that uh, outburst. And then you'll notice down here, these are all of the folks um, who are HAS members besides me, uh, you know, Joel Brewer and Fred Sturway and Renee and uh, Brian Kudnick. Um, and, you know, uh, we each have our own stations. And uh, the nice thing about it is once you get the station set up, uh, the uh, camera uh, views go into a computer and there's automated software that uh, uh, does the uh, uh, the the um, screen captures or the I should say the frame captures, and then at about two o'clock in the afternoon, every afternoon it gets shipped back to uh, Palo Alto, California, where the uh, the compute where computers there go through and uh, uh, ver verify meteor uh, uh, observations. And again, if there's enough data, they actually uh, they actually flag them and uh, and uh, compute the uh, 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 the orbits. Orbital data helps you uh, track the meteor back to its source, and it turns out that uh, uh, the majority of uh, meteor showers are actually caused by the debris from the tail of comets, and uh, yeah, and although there are uh, quite a number of uh, asteroidal uh, uh, meteors as well. So um, that that's um, the cool thing is when uh, uh, for me is what when uh, we do get um, uh, uh, almost daily. I can go up to the website, put a put a uh, a date in, and it'll show all of the um, uh, all of the uh, uh, meteors that uh, Cam's Texas has caught and uh, and list who got how many. So just uh, a, a couple of quick numbers. Back in uh, 2020, uh, when uh, Walt got started with this, in 2020, uh, Cam's Texas. Uh, caught 960 meteors. In 2021, it was almost 17,500. And in 2022, it was just a few short of 20,000 meteors. And uh, the other cool thing, um, if you were watching the net slider a couple weeks back, um, uh, Walt uh, was on there. We had um, uh, reports, I think Brian was out at the site and several other people were out observing on the 18th of uh, uh, February, and there was a big fireball that went through. Well, Cam's Texas caught it, and and I my cam uh, my cameras got the most of it, and that actually uh, resulted. We're pretty sure in a meteor fall that was down uh, uh, down towards Quero, uh, you know, in south southwest Texas area. So it, that's kind of the cool uh, part about this one, um, and then. Sometimes you have real surprises. You get, um, uh, you actually do capture pictures of these fireballs. The one, this one here, Fred Surway, uh, when he 
put his uh, cameras together and got them going the first, the very first night, he caught this multiple uh, fireball uh, on his first night out. And this particular one, I think, uh, came from one of Walt's cameras, uh, 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 was a uh, quite a large fireball back in 2021 as well. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, I don't know if we have any uh, uh, questions. I, I see uh, Brian's basically said, um, uh, uh, okay, uh, that uh, he missed that he he missed the uh, saw the flash but missed the fireball on the 18th. Okay, so uh, any other questions? Okay. Okay, so my turn. Yes, and, turn it over uh, to you, Walt. Okay, and uh, let's see, I will request control. And there you go. Okay, well, fantastic. So uh, I'm going to present something a little different. Um, if I can get the slide to advance. Okay, so... Um, uh, there is a, uh, a quite the nice facility out in the hill country. Uh, it's um, Madrona Peak Observatory, and it was built um, by Mark Williams and family. Oh gosh, sorry, am I doing that? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure what happened, but let's see. We'll, let's see if we can get it back. I didn't touch anything. I promise. No. Um, Why don't I let you do all the advancing? Okay, that that's fine. Um, let me uh, stop the share here and uh, see if I can get this back to full screen. Okay. Well, anyhow, so uh, Mark, Mark Williams was an executive with Shell Oil, and um, he built uh, that observatory that you saw on the screen there. It has a 24-inch Richie Crachian made by Arcos um, in a big dome up on a hill out in the hill country. And um, Mark operated for a number of years. He set it up as a remotely capable telescope with the idea of helping uh, education in addition to just enjoying using it himself. And, and then Mark passed away. Uh, he had a bout of cancer um, and uh, we lost him a few years ago. And um, Bill Pellerin uh, was a good friend of his. And uh, and so uh, Bill Pellerin asked me and a few other folks, Don Selly and Bill Flanagan, if we wouldn't help him to um, keep Madrona Peak up and running and doing what Mark had intended for it to be. And and so we've been doing that for a number of years now. Um, any luck with the slides? Um, yeah, I can do the next one. No, I'm not seeing them at you all. Don't see them. Oh, you're not. Oh, you're not seeing them. I'm sorry. No. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. I didn't realize that. Uh, share. Uh, um, okay, that is another screen. Yeah, I know. It's like where's. Um, why am I only seeing one screen? Hang on. Let me. Uh, well, now I'll I'll keep talking. Um, and so uh, it, it's been honestly a lot of effort to to run the telescope um it is fully automated and uh one thing about being fully automated is that doesn't mean you can walk away and it just works um unfortunately uh it's we're out there at least a few times a year sometimes for just maintenance and sometimes because something has crashed and we've got to fix it um and it's about a five hour drive so it uh, it's a little effort to get out there to do something with it. Um, Are you able to see the screen now? Yes. And okay. um, let's see if you'll go back a couple of slides. Okay. To the one with, um, there you go. That one. Okay. So there's there's the dome, and there's the uh, there's the telescope in the observatory. So go on one slide, please. And. Um, so just real quickly, it is automated. We do have to spend some time out there working with it. And it is so fully automated that we could just let it go and it would open when it's clear and shut when it's not and everything else. But we don't, we don't trust that. 
Um, you know, you would hate for a, a bad sensor to open in the middle of a rainstorm. And so in truth, um, we, we do shepherd it and, and make sure everything's okay as it goes through its work. Uh, and that, that's actually a picture of it uh, was taken with the telescope a, a few years ago by Bill Flanagan. Next slide, please. Here's a, just a representative screenshot of what the computer looks like when you're working with the telescope. So th there are almost 30,000 pieces of software running there, I think. Um, and uh, may maybe not quite 30,000, but you can see a, we have a web camera that's looking at the telescope. Um, we've got a weather station that's watching weather and rain and actually two weather stations. There's uh, two different technologies um, to have some redundancy. Um, and this was actually a daytime shot. And you can see that uh, uh, to the upper right, it says it was a very cloudy day that was calm, dry, dry but light. And that's because the sun was up and that makes it light. Um, Next one, please. Here's some of the projects we've been working on. Uh, I do cataclysmic variable star work with that scope uh, that gets contributed to the Center for Backyard Astrophysics that uh, Chris talked about and also the AAVSO2. Uh, and believe it or not, we've done a whole bunch of Hubble Space Telescope support and we've just started doing some James Webb Space Telescope support too. Uh, to the, uh, the, the figure on the upper right there is a light curve of a cataclysmic variable called OV Boo and uh, in constellation Boötes. And it is quite the fascinating star. Um, it did its first explosion ever seen back in 2017. Uh, at least at the time, it was the only population two star to ever seen at ever be seen as a cataclysmic variable. And so population two star means it's one of the original early stars from the Milky Way galaxy um, out in the halo of the galaxy. It, it's interesting in lots of ways. One of the cool things is you see the eclipse there. That's when the white dwarf goes behind the companion star. And most of the light is coming from the white dwarf and the, um, the, uh, accretion disk. And so when that faint companion star blocks it, we get that amazing ecl eclipse where it drops down a couple of magnitudes. And, and yes, the scale is right there. It, it gets down uh, between 19 and 20th magnitude at its faintest. So other projects. Uh, uh, oh, and by the way, all of that data is from the minor or, or from a drone peak. Um, and so um, we also do exoplanet work. Uh, we're working with uh, a person from Brazil, Andre Kovac, who's also an amateur like the rest of us, who um, has done a lot of the analysis of the work. And then we're working with some University of Texas astronomers. They have, uh, they believe they've directly imaged an exoplanet uh, around AB Araiki with the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, while the Hubble Space Telescope is, is working it, um, it's visited that star three times in the last two months. Um, our ground campaign has been watching what the star has been doing uh, to give the framework around these short bits of time that Hubble gets to spend on it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, uh, you know, that telescope can do a lot and we're just a few of us. And so we have opened it up to a wider group. And so it is now part of what's called the AABSO net. And so it's one of the remotely operated telescopes that is used by AABSO members. And so that's amateur astronomers, professional astronomers, and we've done some work for high school students and teachers too. And uh, Bill Pellerin, one of the collaborating team does his R core bore work with that telescope. He's been following those fascinating stars that get uh, dust cloud formation above them. And, and they suddenly drop precipitously in brightness and then slowly recover. And so he's been monitoring those for several years now. And then I have also done asteroid work um, with uh, 
uh, Dr. Peter Provitz out of the Czech Republic. And on the right-hand side, you'll see that curve uh, that was a, um, a near-Earth object um, where we did the photometry and, and that photometry, that light curve tells you how fast that object is rotating because as it's, you know, they're generally kind of potato shaped. And so as the potato is, is face on to you, it's bright. And as it's kind of pole on to you, it's less bright. And so you can figure out how, how fast they, uh, they rotate and doing that over different years from different perspectives, you can actually figure out what the shape of the asteroid is. So cool stuff. Uh, next one, please. Oh, I think that's the last one, Walt. Okay. Yep. Yep. Sure enough. Okay. Well, any questions? Well, um, yeah. Uh, how long have you been uh, doing this kind of work, uh, Walt? Uh, I got started... Oh, I took my first CCD picture in 1998 and um, have just been doing more and more of it ever since. Um, I, I really do enjoy getting the chance to not, not just look through the eyepiece, which is what I started doing in fourth grade, um, but now with the advent of CCD cameras and that kind of thing, us Joe amateurs can, can actually do real work and, and the pros use that work. And uh, it's, it's actually quite valuable across a number of fields. So. Okay. I, I, uh, I guess we can, uh, all of the presenters can come off mute now. And so. So I, uh, I just want to uh, uh, make a real quick uh, comment. Uh, when I first got started uh, in astronomy, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, uh, I became aware that there was science going on and uh, it always intrigued me, but I just I never quite had the, you know, wherewithal to take the first step. But, uh, you know, I've taken a small step now and I, I have to say it's really it's really uh, I'm sorry I didn't do it sooner. OK, so I just want to let all of you all out there know that it seems like, oh, well, I'm just going to be taking pictures of stars and measuring the stars. Well, it's way more than that. OK, uh, astro imaging is taking pictures of, you know, things that are going to look pretty and making pretty pictures. And that's cool. But taking pictures of things that are kind of bland and turning it into information is way cooler. Okay, so that's that's all. Uh, that's pretty much my my comment. So as a newbie, and Don, I guess I'll add to that too. That uh, there's lots of amateurs that do this who are real happy to to help people along and whatever they're particularly interested in. And, and there's actually quite a few pros who realize that the amateurs are, uh, are quite a resource and uh, are, are real happy to, um, to help you learn, to help you to do things. Uh, it's the, the pro-am stuff is really active in astronomy. Yeah, I'll echo exactly what, what uh, Don and Walt just said. You know, it's I never thought I would ever be captivated by this. And it's just a very fulfilling way of, of interacting with, with the universe. Um, one other ancillary thing that this has really helped me out with and just visual observing in general is it's really improved my star hopping skills. If you think about it, you know, when you're star hopping to a variable star, your target looks exactly like what you know you're star hopping from. So you get really, really good at field identification. And that has helped me out at the dark side by I'm able to find objects faster, which might, means I'm able to see more deep sky objects. So that's a not really, really nice ancillary benefit to the, my variable star work. All right. Can I ask a question? Sure. So one time I was on a long, uh, you know, transatlantic flight. We were over the middle of nowhere in, you know, northeastern Canada. And there's this ferocious lightning storm going off, you know, outside the plane to the right. 
and then it started doing sprites, just one after another after another. How how rare an observation is that? How common are sprites? That, that's, that only happened once. And it was sort of funny because everybody's watching the in-flight movie, and then I was trying to get my neighbors to look at it, and then they, the, the stewardess came and shut my window and told me to stop talking. <laughs> wow. That's that's unfortunate. Uh, what you saw oh, no, there? No, I just opened the window up, up again. I waited oh, for yeah. the leave, and I just stopped trying to get my neighbors interested in it. Turn the light <laughs> off and get it back in there. Now, what you saw was very rare. I mean, um, Native Americans, uh, you know, ancient sky watchers, they all saw this stuff. They probably thought it was storm gods or something. Who knows? Uh, but you know, people like you were in planes and pilots reporting these kind of weird. Uh, flashes above a thunderstorm right so they had been reported for years and then in 89 we got our first like video or it was a image um of a sprite so uh you're in a handful of people uh in in the club of people who've seen naked eye sprites um it's a small club especially it's even smaller for the people who can identify what they saw like you know it was sprites that you saw i knew what it was i, yeah. I had to think about it for a second it's like wait a minute i remember reading about this in science news you know it's and, freaky and it, yeah it's freaky we, it, it looks like standing people when you see them sometimes in naked eye and you're like whoa what what was that it was you know it's almost like a flash of a bunch of ghosts standing in a group it's kind of what strange. i what i saw was uh the storm was making uh lightning going down and then occasionally one of the lightning bolts would be extra bright. And then a tiny fraction of a second after the extra bright one going down, then there was this brilliant hot pink uh, thing that went up and exploded into tentacles. Yep, that's and a positive. More than likely, those really bright, really quick uh, cloud to ground strikes are almost always positive. I think they're like 5 to 10% of all lightning strikes in the world. So they're more on the rare side than the negative strikes. And those positive strikes, yeah, they'll kick off what we call the jellyfish, which is these tentacled, crazy looking, you know. And it was just absolutely great. vibrant, hot pink color tentacles going up real fast, you know, but not instantaneous, but you could see them go up. Right. And, and, but it happened just a tiny fraction of a second after this extra bright lightning went down. And it was doing it about once every 30 seconds for about like, you know, 10, 15 minutes as we went past it and it was off in the distance. And, yeah, that uh, storm was probably building at the time and then it probably, yeah. It was somewhere over northeastern Canada in the middle of the night. And uh, yeah, I would try to get my neighbors in the plane to open the window and look at it and they all wanted to watch the movie. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Will, uh, Ken, Kenneth Drake uh, uh, had a note in the chat that he'd be interested in starting a sprite alert group, which sounds pretty cool. I, I have never seen one. I'd love to see one sometime. And let's do it. Um, uh, join spritetacular.org. Uh, get get on there, and you don't have to be submitting photos to you know be a part of the group. Um, and uh, because it's a kind of a brand, their website launched like October, I think. So this is all fresh. We got we got the ground floor opportunity, y'all. It's like I'm like I'm an investing you know guru. I'm like invest in this. It's right at the ground floor. But yeah, so oh, oh great, great. <laughs> so uh, okay, well, I want to add uh, something real quick. Uh, there's uh, sprites are, are are a good reason to go to Texas Star Party. All right, um, I didn't even I I had no idea what a sprite was. The first time I went to uh, uh, the first TSP I went to was in two thousand and four. And uh, it was down on the lower field, setting up my camera uh, uh, stuff. And there was a fellow next to me and he had binoculars and uh, and I ended up sharing a bottle of wine with him uh, while I was setting up, which was probably the best thing I could have done. Uh, <laughs> but um, he had night vision goggles and uh, he introduced me to night vision on my first time at TSP. And we ended up we had a really bad storm that went through Fort Davis. And the next night he said, do you ever see a Sprite? No, I've never. I have no idea what you're talking about. And we spent probably an hour watching sprites through his, uh, you know, back and forth through his uh, night vision goggles. Uh, 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 the storm had gone up uh, north, uh, uh, northeast of uh, Fort Davis. And uh, anyway, the, you, you, the, that's the kind of territory that uh, you can see him. You, Stephen Hummel is out there in Fort Davis. So that's, you know, it's a good reason to go to Texas Star Party. 
Maybe and you'll see a sprite. Absolutely. Okay, so we've got a, a number of questions that have come through, but uh, Stephen, I, I wonder if we have overstayed our time and should hand it back. Uh, you know what? Well, nobody told me anything about a timeline. <laughs> <laughs> well, when everybody starts dropping off, I guess we'll know we found it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah, all right. So, um, let's see is there if anybody wants to just open their mic and jump in okay well why don't we go ahead and wrap it up Stephen? all right sounds good mm -hmm.